my name is Lucie Guibault. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. It's uh, an honor to be on Mi'kmaq territory. Thank you very much uh, for the warm welcome of the community. It's my first visit uh, in the Mi'kmaq community and I'm very happy to be here. So tonight I suggest to, to uh, talk together uh, about how to pr legally protect indigenous culture. And please feel free Anytime you have a question, anytime that you perhaps um, feel free to contribute, or if I'm not clear, I don't mind at all if you interrupt me and ask a question. We have at least an hour and a half in front of us, so um, let's feel comfortable, and I hope that this will not be just from me, but also a conversation with you, because I really want this to be... Um, a conversation that we have together about a uh, very interesting topic of how to protect uh, indigenous culture. So tonight, to start off, uh, this is uh, what I plan to discuss, just a, bit, a little bit of information about me, so that you know who you're talking to. Uh, then um, just uh, some view of Mi'kmaq culture in the context of today's uh, or tonight's um, presentation. Then how the law works, um, we're talking about legal protection of indigenous culture, so we will see together that um, it's not so well cut out currently for the protection of indigenous culture and I will explain to you uh, why not and then hopefully we can uh, throughout have a conversation and come to, you know, where do we go from here and um, what can we do about it. So this is uh, tonight's program, and uh, let's start. So a bit, a little bit about me. Uh, it's a bit small. I hope that you all can uh, see at the back. So my name is Lucie Guibault. Uh, I was born and raised in Montreal uh, from French ancestors, and um, I studied, therefore, uh, law uh, at Université de Montréal in French. Um, and in June of 97, I left Montreal and I went to live in the Netherlands. And I spent ten, uh, 20 years in the Netherlands working at the University of Amsterdam. So I'm um, um, uh, uh, yeah, an academic by profession. I worked uh, back in Montreal for maybe a year and a half in a big law firm and I really disliked it uh, tremendously. And that's almost the, the kick, uh, the, the reason that let me leave Montreal to, to go to the University of Amsterdam, where I spent uh, 20 years. And I joined uh, the Schulich Sco Law School last summer in July. So and I'm very happy to be a member of the, of the law school now. And I'm a therefore new uh, uh, resident of the beautiful province of Nova Scotia. And um, I worked there for 20 years in the field of copyright law. And all those years working at the University of Amsterdam, I also uh, tried to uh, research um, about copyright law, about the balance that should be uh, reached to balance the interests of authors and users. And unfortunately, many times I noticed in my research, and also sometimes I became uh, a bit of an advocate uh, for the rights of the authors or for the rights of the users, but many times I, I noticed that actually it's mainly the interests of the intermediaries, of the big companies in, in, in the middle that are uh, being listened to, and it, it becomes a bit frustrating, uh, to, be, to say the least. And what brings me to tonight's topic is, well, I also see that copyright law is often, please welcome. Um, copyright law is one legal regime that is often presented as a one size fits all. That, you know, if it, if it work or if a, a cultural expression doesn't fit the Copyright Act, then it's not protected and then that's the end of the story. And to, we'll see tonight that, well, there should not be necessarily a one-size-fits-all, and there are many reasons and there are many uh, circumstances where uh, maybe we should think of uh, adapting the, the system or finding a new system. And I think that indigenous culture is certainly 
uh, it's a beautiful culture. It deserves to be protected. And um, I would really be happy to do more research and to try to find a solution together uh, to f find a better way to protect it than currently. But we'll um, discuss tonight how things work so that we can start thinking together or how to make things better. Okay, I found these, these are beautiful, you, you I guess will recognize most of these. Um, we hear, um, unfortunately the, the image is not very clear and you may uh, recognize some of them. I don't know if this may, uh, it, it's, um, I don't know. The it's a bit clearer. I find this. Do you do you recognize this? Can you talk to me about it a bit? Anyone? It, it's empowerment David by David Brooks. And is it a painting or is it a stained glass? Painting. It's a painting. It's beautiful. Um, does anyone where, know where it is hanging? Where it's being. It looks like Ah. Well, I'm not sure. Okay. And so some some of his work are hanging, and some are book covers, or um, a bit everywhere, all over. all over. Yes, but what he makes is beautiful. Yes. Um, in the middle. Oh well, now I, I blurred it. Uh, ah, yes, in the middle, but it's blurred you have a dancer, a traditional dancer. Um, I think, well, I, I must <laughs> be honest, I, I took those pictures from the internet. So um, here I tried to give uh, credit where I could because I, I found the name of the author and the, the title of the work. This is a traditional um, dancer, Mi'kmaq dancer, a beautiful uh, dress. Uh, yeah, oh please also excuse <laughs> Yes, and Dutch, so sometimes uh, I lose my, my English because of the French and the Dutch, so please forgive me if I don't always find the correct words. Um, this is a poster I also found, um, I think it was advertising an event of the Mi'kmaq community uh, in the recent years, and what I liked about it, it um, it depicts, I think, some dreams and some legends. Uh, and I don't know if you can see it a bit uh, clearly, but it's uh, certainly a very colorful and beautiful uh, poster that gave the idea of conveying uh, somewhat of a, a known legend for your community, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, and of course, uh, Gluskap, is that how you pronounce it, Gluskap? And who's a uh, few meters that way, I think. Yes, uh, beautiful statue. So those are all different types of cultural expressions. Some may be protected by uh, copyright or by other regimes, but others are not. And this is what I'd like to explain to you tonight, when some are, when are some are not. But why is it that we should protect it? And, uh, and I think this is also clear. This is, abs this is clear to me and it clear to you that culture is a, a community's or a people's identity. Um, it conveys values and ideals and meaning. So, and, it, and that's why, because it's so close to a, a populations or people's identity, it deserves to be protected. And this has been recognized in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. It also has been recognized in the UNESCO Convention on uh, Cultural Diversity. So it's clear that the, the link between uh, the culture and a community uh, needs to be protected. So, and of course, protecting, uh, yes? Question, I guess. Yes. Um, 
when I look at culture, I also look at now knowledge. Yes. Right. And it's not just um, culture under the UN and the culture, but uh, at the UN international level, there's protection on and uh, Aboriginal traditional knowledge yes. and, and intellectual knowledge. And, and I'm just wondering when you talk about culture, how the you know, talk about the no, bigger, and yes. Intellectual property and all that. I know it's a big issue. issue yes. Um, you're right, actually, that uh, the work that's going, currently going on at the international level treats three, three aspects. Uh, one is genetic resources. Uh, it can be the genetic resources of the population. It could also be the genetic resources of the uh, fauna or flora in a particular uh, territory. So that's one. Traditional knowledge is also uh, something that's being discussed. And the knowledge is, is uh, a bit different from culture. It's closer to know-how. It's how to use plants, perhaps, for medicinal uh, um, uh, cures or uh, other know-hows, uh, how to deal with uh, the environment that you live in. Yes. And the third one in that discussion, uh, this uh, international discussion, is the traditional uh, cultural expression. And you're right to raise it. Um, and I forgot to say that tonight um, I'd like to concentrate on the cultural expressions because um, the other two types, you know, uh, uh, the genetic resources and the traditional knowledge. Um, they're closer to other types of uh, intellectual property rights than those that I'd like to talk to discuss tonight. So the cultural expressions, they would be protected, if at all, under the copyright regime, where genetics resources and traditional knowledge might be protected, if at all, under patent law. And I didn't want to, mainly, I don't know if you agree, um, <laughs> okay. Well, I could come back another time <laughs> and uh, and talk about genetic resources, but I I, fo I thought that tonight we could focus on tr uh, cultural expressions. I think for indigenous peoples, it's really hard for us to put into categories cultural expression, uh, traditional knowledge, and genetic resources when it may be. Um, the art holistic of using eels um, in sort of cultural expressions, but also medicine and also, you know, it can go through all three. Yes. For us, the people that are looking at the resources, it's really hard to put in, into categories. It's just, it's blurred, I guess, a lot of gray area. But yes. Like, you got to understand, our, I'm in I'm in mom. Yes. So you have to, and Cheryl, so you have to understand our ways because we, from the beginning of when we're born, we're raised this way of thinking. Well, for me anyway, um, my family was not part of residential school, so my family never been assimilated into that residential school um, thinking and stuff like that. So my way of thinking was always treaty based. Good. So, I don't know if that makes sense to yes. what you're saying and what you're saying. Because, because from my perspective, uh, I'm looking at this and um, they're talking about cultural and stuff like that. I, I was raised in treaty. I got from, from when I was a little kid, I was raised in treaty. Know my treaty rights, know my culture, know my ceremonies. Everything that we do is based on ceremony and tradition and treaty rights. Everything we do, 24-7 is ceremony. I, I, and this is the, the thing that I was saying. It's like we're going to look at it as copyright and cultural expressions. But I know Aboriginal students that go to law. It's one of the hardest things in the world, not because we can't read or write. No. 
but to be able to separate what law is able to do. And law has to isolate it and make tests and then apply those tests. And if they don't work, then we need to go and challenge that law and challenge that test. So she's going to have to give us this presentation based on a cutout piece yeah. as a sample. But for us to know that there's cultural expressions in a category and she can come back with genetic but resources <laughs> and we can also come back and look at Aboriginal traditional knowledge. Yes. <laughs> genetic resources <laughs> is the medicines that you get from a plant. Okay. That's like a genetic resource. And Sorry, traditional medicine. Yes, mm. but it's the genetic makeup, and there's a the whole. DNA. Yes, the DNA, law yes. And international law that's talking about it. So it would be a course on its own, not even just a, a, a present lecture. Yeah. Um, but I think this conversation was good to let us know that right now we're looking at law and how it's applied to one area, one pillar, but that we know that there's the lines are really great for all of Aboriginal knowledge and all of our resources and all of our um, cultural uses. So you're going to be just fine <laughs> doing the copyright piece. And now we all know that we're looking at that small piece. Thank <laughs> you. But you know, this is what I know now. And this is, well, two things. First, I have to be very candid with all of you that this is a, su a subject that I'm just exploring uh, since very recently. Uh, because, as, as I just explained, I moved after 20 years of living in the Netherlands, I moved here. I, want, I really care about this issue, but I'm just starting my research in it. So, so that's the first. I'm, I'm candid, I'm starting. But the second part is, I understand what you're saying, also what you're saying. And your gift to me is to make me understand your way of understanding, you know? So I want this to be conversation, and I want you to explain to me how things work for you so that we can work together in trying to find solutions. Now I will remember not to put things in boxes. Mm -hmm. um, they are in boxes. They, yes. If you guys guys me. I know. <laughs> And my task is to understand how the treaty law works, mm -hmm. especially in, in the finesse, in the, in the subtleties, in the details of this topic, which is complex in the, in the white man's world, but it's also complex, I'm sure, on the treaty law. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting off this as a, as a dialogue. Yes, and I hope that it will be ongoing. I don't, um, I'd like to be back, perhaps not as a presentation, but perhaps to have discussions uh, in the future so that we can meet and understand each other. Because, see, I think my uh, strong point is that I really know very well how the regime, how the system works. And the day that I will understand how your system works, I hope that we'll, we'll be able to, to create something new that will fit the needs of the community. So that's my wish. And I'm not the only one. Huh? I can see it. I can see how it could fit. And what you're saying, Madonna, I, and I know it's, it's, it's broad, this is treaty law. It's, it is, and it's yeah. true. But how to get that out there? At the international, they're, left, they're talking about it as genetic resources and indigenous peoples are fighting to have in their protection of their genetic resources and their full authority over the genetic resources and everything. So that language is out there at the international level, but not in Canada, not as laws that, that the courts will listen to in Canada yet. Um, but what she's gonna talk to us about now is copyright law and how to protect the owners of it. So we can learn about that and then apply it to our way of thinking. Um, 
It'd be good if you had notes so we could take notes. And I really like, like, your what your, presentation. like what you're saying and like what you're saying. I still don't agree with it. Well, we didn't even get through this session. No, I know, I know. <laughs> um, we didn't even start it yet. <laughs> if, you need, if you need, there's a pad of paper and our pens yeah. at the back, yeah, exactly. if what you I'm, want. Yeah. Oh, she's right on. Um, what what yes, I think but we should do, because this is a really good conversation for everybody, even you. Yeah, speak. oh, absolutely. Um, but yes. let's get through your presentation, and we'll take notes. I know I, I have students here, too. And then we'll have better discussion, but it's a good discussion, and it's one that I hear at the international level, I hear this, but not in the community. Ah. That's why we're here. Yes, yeah. good, good. Okay, well, let's go back to what I prepared, and then we'll, after that... Well, we'll get through it, and then after that, we can really have the discussion. Yeah? Okay. So, um, well, of course, just to go back anyway, um, you know this, but it needs to be emphasized every time, every, uh, every time again is, well, you know, indeed, uh, protecting indigenous culture is vital because it allows, it preserves the culture for, of the community. Uh, it allows the culture to grow because culture is a living, uh, living thing. It's not static. Uh, you know, you you evolve with your culture, and the culture uh, evolves with you. So it's very important. And well, why do we protect it? Especially for the last point, I guess, uh, to prevent appropriation by others. And I know last year, and it, it comes in in the newspapers every once in a while, that that you will see that. Uh, indigenous culture will be used by non-related people and will usually companies or or sometimes uh, unaware people that are who are unaware um, uh, and and very often they will make money uh, out of uh, either the genetic resources or the the culture and and the community will not benefit and this is this is really wrong uh, so by, by finding a system that will allow us to protect indigenous culture, hopefully we will be able to prevent such uh, appropriation by third parties. Okay, so this is from the literature, uh, and, and this is where the, the discussion with... Um, with you guys, with the community, will, will allow me to pinpoint better what do we want to protect? Well, this is what I gathered from the literature. There are three main elements, I think, that we would like to protect. Uh, first, we want to make sure that attribution or that, uh, that the source of the cultural object is uh, being given, meaning that uh, Gluskap, we all know, is a Mi'kmaq statue, it's a Mi'kmaq legend. It should be attributed to the Mi'kmaq community, and it should not be uh, attributed to anybody else than the Mi'kmaq community. So that's one. Recognition, where does this cultural um, expression come from? Second one, the possibility to control, to preserve, to safeguard the culture. So who should have a say on what happens to the Gruskap legend? Well, it's the Mi'kmaq community, not anybody else. So the power to decide what, uh, what happens with this element of culture and whether or not to exploit it or whether or not to keep it secret, there are uh, rituals. And this is also what I'd like to learn from you guys. Um, there are elements that you agree to make public, but there are also other elements, I'm sure, that should remain secret. But the problem is that we white people, we don't know which is which. And there might be... Not secret, sacred. 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 Thank you. But the sacred items should not be made public. So should be kept secret. No? It's a definition. It's a, it's a, it depends on what ceremony it is. Yeah. Some people are like that about the language yeah. too. Like they don't really like. Um, I don't know. It seems like they don't really like to teach people that aren't 
like Mi'kmaq almost aren't from like their like same tribe or culture or whatever. Because um like even um my my dad's from New Brunswick, my mom's from Nova Scotia, so they speak almost well my mom doesn't really speak Mi'kmaq, she lost out of like residential schools and stuff, but my dad doesn't really speak to my mom even in Mi'kmaq or try to because their Mi'kmaq is a lot different than ours. And so like Nova Scotians judge like like a lot of Cape Bretoners will judge how people in New Brunswick speak their Mi'kmaq because it's so different. So like yeah, so like my dad never dialects. really taught it. Dialects. Because, so you refrain from speaking because there are differences in dialect? That's too bad, yeah. isn't it? Because I guess like back in the day like they would make fun of him for it. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's different. And like the like even like now, not even back in the day too, but like you'll hear them sometimes making fun of how like oh they're saying it wrong, they're saying it wrong, this is how you say it. Like it's it's different. And every community is different. Yeah, yeah. No, just, but yeah. believe me, that's not typical Mi'kmaq. I, I, I can confirm that. I'm from the Netherlands. I can confirm that. He comes from a village in the south of the Netherlands. He speaks one dialect, uh, which I learned to understand. But uh, about 20 kilometers uh, further, there's another village that has a totally different dialect, just a small distance. And uh, they also tease each other. <laughs> um, well, we go to Newfoundland and they're supposed to speak English and we don't understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> so, but I, although I understand the differences in dialect, I would find it uh, a pity if people refrain from talking because of being teased. Because this, to me, sounds like... Ah. But um, I think more of what I was going with it was like, uh, like they, they like to keep their language more like sacred into the, like their songs, I guess. Like I never really see, well actually no, that's a lie too, because there are some teachers and stuff at the schools who are non mute but they, um, they do know like a lot of the law and stuff. But that's just because they work in the school system, so they kind of like have to teach it too. But I don't really see too many white people early. Yeah, non-natives trying to um, get in on the language I and have any people willing to teach them too. Because I feel like if someone's going to take the time to teach you, like they'd probably rather teach their own. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That's like the medicine. Yeah. yeah. I know our elders. A lot of our elders refuse to share their medicines with non-natives, and it's not a race thing. It's because we do because we do ceremony when we pick our yeah. medicines, and when we pick, it's it's very sacred. Again, going back to that sacredness. But when you try to show this to a non-native, a lot of things that happen, and this happens in our mm -hmm. own with our own people too. Um, they go out and they pick all the medicines from that area. <coughs> and when they do that, all that medicine is gone mm -hmm. from that area. So this is why our elders try to keep yeah. everything sacred. Yeah. So, like we have black ash trees that like um, are like secretly planted all over the place because they don't want people going and like harvesting their the black ash from them. So like there's certain things like that. Like right now and yeah. Um, I have a question on who owns the knowledge, the name, ah. the people, and everything. So I, I I don't know if that's too big for right now. Or if that's no, later in your it's session. coming. So there we go. There we go. <laughs> so. Um, so we're getting into now the core of the subject, the co uh, copyright law. So this, how does copyright law work? Um, so copyright, it, I think, is the main legal regime that we would use to protect cultural expressions. You also have um, performers' rights, but it's, uh, it's integrated into the Copyright Act in Canada. So let's just call it copyright law. But copyright law applies to certain, a certain type of works. Um, for example, uh, songs, paintings, dances, sculptures. So what copyright law protects is um, any work made by an individual or a group of individuals that is original 
and this is this is a problem perhaps for uh, cultural expressions, traditional cul uh, cultural expressions, that for copyright law to apply, uh, a work must not be copied and must be their own intellectual creation or does uh, show some skill and judgment uh, on the part of the author. So uh, a, an expression that comes from generation to generation and that's being handed down from grandmother to granddaughter, etc., will not be original in the sense of the Copyright Act. Um, usually, uh, copyright law applies to works that are fixed on a tangible medium. And this would also eliminate legends, for example, because legends are oral, legends are not fixed you know, uh, the legend will be protected as soon as it is written on paper or, uh, hmm? or, recorded. or recorded, yes. Like a book. Like a book, like a CD or stuff. But if it's just uh, an oral tradition, if it's not fixed on a, t a tangible medium, then it will not be protected by copyright. And I must admit that this has never been tested by the courts. It, it could. It's tangible, yes, it could, I guess. I think a good example for us to think about and is for the Mi'kmaq, we have the eight point star and it's on a Petroglyphs and Kechimakuchi. But the eight point star is used everywhere on art, design. So the artists are making paintings and pictures of the image of the eight point star. But it's, it's a, a cultural expression of the Mi'kmaq people, the Mi'kmaq nation. How do you protect the use of something that belongs to all of us that was handed down and now put on, like, you know, and that's, I think, the challenge with this whole area. Yes, exactly. So um, here I have a, a little doll um, that I also found on the internet, to be quite honest. And it's made by Crystal. Crystal yes, thank you. Uh, you recognize it? Yeah. Yes. yes? <laughs> ah, well, that's what I thought. Uh, that's what I thought. But I also assume, maybe I'm wrong, but I also assume that, she, that her dolls are each unique and that she creates those dolls and that she doesn't copy those dolls from anyone. So my assumption is, therefore, that because those dolls are uh, fixed on a tangible medium, they're original because she creates them from herself. She's the main author, and there, there are a category of works that, you know, that falls under the Copyright Act. So most probably, her dolls are protected by copyright law. If she applies for them? Ah, that's a good question, which I forgot to mention. Copyright is automatic. Just by creating something original, you get protection. So, and the protection lasts for the life of the author plus in Canada, plus 50 years after the death. In other countries like the United States and Europe, it's the life of the author plus 70 years after the author's death. Meaning... How would, it, how would that be applicable for somebody that is an artist that might make prints, like multiple copies of their work? And well, you don't, yeah, the, you make a distinction in law between the tangible embodiment of that print and the work itself. So the work will be protected for the life of the author plus 70 years or uh, plus 50 years after the death. The prints will be protected for the same period. So even if you make one print or 70 prints, 
it's that work, it's the design, or it's the, the drawing, or it's the painting, that will be protected for, for so long. So those little dolls uh, are most likely protected by copyright law. That she could, um, she could sue. She could institute uh, legal proceedings uh, claiming copyright infringement. So she could take the, the other person who copies her work to court uh, for copyright infringement. What about things that are on the internet? Where Facebook, you can just share and say Well, <laughs> In principle, putting something on the internet doesn't mean that you give permission for anyone to, to use. Sometimes there is a permission because sometimes you will see that there's a license allowing you, so a text, a contract allowing you to use for certain purposes or to use freely. Or, uh, but mainly, things that are on the internet, well, are subject to copyright law. If, if they're original, you know. They're, they're certainly fixed on a tangible medium, um, and if they if they fall within the category uh, of works that are, that copyright protects, so in principle, works that are put on the internet are protected. And if you copy them, like that, this is why I say I took this little doll, <laughs> and you could almost say that I'm infringing Mrs. Gload's. Uh, copyright, I will say that it's <laughs> for, yes, for review, for criticism, or for, you know, there are exceptions in the Copyright Act that would allow me to do certain fair dealing or certain uses, and I think giving a presentation tonight might fall under the exception of the Copyright Act, but in general, um, you can't just take things from the internet because Yes. Like my brother, uh, one of his buddies will borrow a picture, but they'll give him the credit. Well, that's what I try to, to do here. <laughs> uh, I put the name of the artist below, although it's fuzzy, and I'm sorry. But the intention is there, and I did mention. When you're getting information from the book, you have to put those links on the back of the book. Yes. And if you quote, you, you put between a quotation mark and you give the reference. So this is, this is allowed. You're always uh, allowed to quote. Absolutely. So this is the situation on the Copyright Act. But it also um, is complemented by other regimes that might be applicable to certain types of expression. Um, so we just saw uh, copyright law, which protects works of art. We could also invoke trademark law, and trademark law protects signs and slogans. And you will see here, this is a, this is a very interesting website. If you're curious, um, two years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I, IP in so IP in cultural heritage, uh, intellectual property issues in cultural heritage, and the website is. Um, I think partly formed with uh, IP Inch. Um, so this would be protectable under the Trademark Act. Um, and trademark, you know, I'm sure you can give me a whole bunch of examples of trademarks. Coca-Cola, Nike, uh, uh, you know, those are all trademarks. But they could also the trademark law could be useful to protect some of um, your slogans or, or signs that you use to identify the Mi'kmaq community. And some of the websites of the Mi'kmaq community do have a very nice logo or, or slogan. Now, trademark law could be useful to protect those. Thank you. Very good question. What is it? Uh, trademark, you would need to apply for it. 
and you apply for it at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, well, compared to patent law, it's not very expensive because it's $200 uh, instead of a few thousand dollars. But then uh, you get protection of your trademark for at least a period of, uh, well, the law will change. Initially, it was for a period of 15 years, and it will change to a period of 10 years. But you can renew the registration of the trademark as long as you use the trademark. So in principle, and this is why Coca-Cola, the trademark, is, is protected. Uh, you know, they keep you renew and uh, the certificate uh, uh, to, uh, of protection of, uh, of the Coca-Cola trademark. So. That's also a very good question. <laughs> it's <laughs> yes, good. No, don't be sorry. I love this. Um, it's protected throughout Canada, so it's per country. If you want protection in Canada and the United States, for example, you would need to apply in both countries. Um, Europe is a bit different because they they have one registration of trademark uh, in Spain, and that will, that will count for the whole uh, territory of the European Union. But in Canada, if you apply at, at the CEPO, at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, that will be valid throughout Canada. So for certain types of um, signs and slogans, uh, trademark law could be useful. Uh, industrial design could also be useful. Industrial design um, is also not automatic. You also need to apply for it. Um, it's less expensive than a trademark. It's also at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. Uh, but it basically protects the uh, visual aspect of a useful object. So it will protect, this is a quilt. Um, it will protect the design of the quilt. The only downside is that for industrial design, uh, the design must be new. So again, the problem of traditional knowledge or the traditional cultural expression is that if these designs are part of your tradition and I, or have existed for uh, hundreds of years, then uh, they will not meet the criterion of novelty uh, and you will not be able to register for industrial design. And the maximum protection of industrial design anyway is uh, only 20 years. So it's not really interesting because the protection is too short for the purposes of really guaranteeing uh, a level of protection of at least uh, of that type of um, design. Why? Why? Pardon? Why? Why only give a limit of 10 or 20 years? Well, the idea is um, that they, they will protect uh, things like fashion the, or useful objects. And the idea behind it is that uh, companies who engage in the production of such goods, uh, that there's a mode, there's a trend, and that after 20 years of protection, um, it should become in the public domain so that everybody can use the same design, and that the company who has produced those goods, they, they made their profit already, so they don't need an extra protection. It's just the fundamental purpose of that system does not align well, does not fit at all with traditional knowledge. Because it's the industrial uh, design, it's for the industry, an industry that rolls a bit like the fashion industry. You know, you have one season, another. So if you have 20 years, that's already too much. But if you make, you know, if you make a, a lamp, a very fancy lamp, even in furniture, in all those types of uh, objects, there's modes, there's trend, it, f it rolls very fast. So that's what I'm getting at, is that the purpose of these IP rights... Like yeah? Dreamcatcher. Yes. They make Dreamcatcher, but 
it. Then you can go dollar store in Beijing, China. I know. Well, that's outrageous. So, uh, and that's because the Dreamcatcher cannot be protected by copyright, mainly because, not because it's not a work. It, you, you could also consider it to be a work, a bit like the dolls. It's tangible, etc. But because the, the Dreamcatcher is part of the tradition, it's not original anymore. Um, and it's not a trademark, it's not a sign, and, and it's certainly not an industrial design. So it just doesn't fit in any of these rights. What you, what you guys are going to find, and don't get really upset, but Aboriginal knowledge, culture, genetic resources, expressions, they weren't protected anywhere. And these areas of law are just starting to deal with how to protect them, and there's conversations at the international level on all kinds of different categories. And there's a lot of indigenous peoples uh, worldwide that are really fighting to have an area of law that fits the protection of our culture and resources. And you'll see us um, protesting the, um, the sports shirts. And, yes. And so it's a whole area of law that is developing at the national and international level because indigenous peoples are pushing for it. But there's nothing here in laws that fit good. That's why we're like, well, that makes no sense for us, or we were not going to fit into that category. And this so is why I'm here. Mine? No. Oh, ah. ideas. Well, I hope so. But this is, a, it, this is exactly why I'm here. Yeah. Because the, the problem, we're, no, we're so far from a solution. Anyway, so keep going. Time flies yeah, when you're having fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what the law does not protect. Well, it doesn't protect traditional cultural expressions transmitted from generation to generation. Uh, mainly those expressions that form part of the identity and heritage of a traditional or indigenous community. Um, it does not prevent the use of sacred and spiritual objects. Because you see, you know, I discussed copyright law and trademark law and uh, industrial design. That's, that's all for really commercial objects. It's, it doesn't protect at all anything sacred. Um, and it does not safeguard or preserve or promote culture. It's a, you know, those rights, copyright and trademark, they're there to stop others from using, which might be useful for co uh, traditional cultural heritage, but it's, it's, uh, it does not promote it in a, in a, in a useful way. So um, this is what you've been uh, alluding to. Uh, there has been for decades now uh, discussions, mainly at the World Intellectual Property Organization. It's located in Geneva, in Switzerland. And um, in, two, in the year 2000, the WIPO um, uh, created the Intergovernmental Committee, the IGC, and this committee has the mandate to examine and to discuss the issues relating to genetic resources, traditional knowledge, and traditional cultural expressions. So they examine all three of them. And if you go on the WIPO, uh, it's the WIPO.int uh, website, you will see all the documents. They're very transparent, and you can find all the documentation that you want. But you will also see that they're not close to a solution. The two years ago, um, they came up with a draft treaty uh, with three parts. So one part for genetic resources, one part for tradi uh, traditional knowledge, and one part for what they call folklore and traditional cultural expressions. I prefer the traditional cultural expressions because I find folklore <sighs> nah, not, not representative, not not nice, anyway. Um, but the treaty um, in three parts, it's a very, it's a technique of the, of the drafters to put all the, the elements on which they don't have a consensus in brackets. 
So the treaty actually is full of brackets because there's no consensus on almost anything in that document. And what I find interesting to say is this is a picture of the main uh, room at the WIPO. It's the, it's the main uh, audio, uh, auditorium, I would say, the uh, assembly hall. It contains enough space for delegations of 186 countries, plus at least 60 observers at the back of the room. So, and this is just a, a picture of that. Negotiations are incredibly difficult. The legal gaps are humongous. Uh, we, I just gave you now a short overview of all the gaps that we can find in, in the current law that really doesn't fit the needs of uh, indigenous culture. And only, I talked to you only about the traditional cultural expression side of it. And we also have the traditional uh, knowledge and the genetic resources. So putting everything in a box, the, the thing is, it's almost impossible for them now to reach a consensus on how to go forward. And what I also find interesting is that to my surprise, when I read the documents, I find that the Canadian government has a really low profile on these issues. I don't know if you may know, but um, there is a fund to sponsor uh, indigenous communities to go and take part in the discussion. So the WIPO will fund, if you ask for it uh, ahead of time, they will fund the trips of certain communities to go take part in the d discussion. I don't know if you were uh, aware of that. There's a voluntary yes. You went. Exhausting. It's a. People's things that we were all lobbying to get included were in brackets. Then the next reading that came out, there were, no, first it was there, then they were in brackets. Nobody could agree. Everybody's battling. Then it's out of brackets, and then it's in brackets. Then it's not even in the text at all. And this goes on for days and days and days. But the final negotiations, but the treaties are taking years and years and a lot of lobbying. Um, there's not enough Aboriginal people at the international level. We can walk into those doors, we can register, we can go in, but there's not enough of us that are going there because it's very expensive to go to mm -hmm. UN meetings. Yes. It's very boring <laughs> yes. and very technical. Like yep. You have to really, really learn to read the documents, have to learn the protocols of who gets to speak and when, and nations can speak at some of the treaty bodies, but others, there's no place for indigenous peoples to speak. Uh, the permanent forming can speak, climate change, uh, convention on biodiversity, you can't. So it's, it's, we need more people there. I want to take a whole kinds of people. I want to do UN University and then go with a bunch of people. Um, but the fund is very selective and yeah. it's hard for oh. my head. My go do one or two people and it might be somebody that the AFN sends or the National Women's Association. So it's not that useful, you have to find ways. Yeah, uh, you had a question? Donna. Um, I'm just saying, okay, what you guys are talking about is tripartite and stuff like that. Is that creating a new treaty? Is that what you're talking about? The, the wife of world intellectual property, they're looking at an international treaty. So everybody in the wait world- Wait a minute, all our treaties are international. No, 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 no. I'm talking about international treaty bodies under the United Nations. That's different than what we're talking about, big treaties. Treaty bodies under the what? Into the United the nations. nations. They have so many treaty bodies. So one is the Canadian Human Rights, or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Convention on Biodiversity. Um, so there's, and I, I can do a, a we can talk more later if you guys want to do some UN kind of 
kind of workshops um, to explain, but I have posters and diagrams, Madonna, that I can share with you that show you the different treaty bodies and the work being done under each of them. Um, so when we talk about UN treaty bodies, we're not talking about treaties like the nation made law treaties or anything like that. It's the international it's the United Nations. Right. Yes. And, and the treaties are with nations that sign up for these treaties. So Canada doesn't sign into an international treaty. They're not. Canada there. can because they're not in it. I understand your your what you're saying, okay. but it doesn't that doesn't in theory or practicality fit within the way we're using the language now under international conventions. Conventions that yep. states sign up for. Right? I have diagrams that I'll uh, like things that I'll show you. Yes, I, I respect that, it's, yeah. uh, and I, I fully agree with everything you say. Um, I think if, perhaps could you see it? Um, she sees it as a sovereign, new nation perspective, right. and that's what I'm saying. And a lot yes. of people see the world that way and are pushing it. Okay, just keep going, sorry. It's okay. Um, yeah, well, basically, it's almost it's almost impossible to 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 negotiate right now a, a new treaty for the protection of indigenous uh, knowledge or culture. It's uh, I'm amazed you, you've been there, and at least for biodiversity, it's it's a it's a highly frustrating system. <laughs> um, you so you were there. For the five days of the negotiation, of the of course, I've yes. Um, I've, and I, but I've done conventional biodiversity, and I've done some other treaty bodies. So. <laughs> yeah, that takes a lot of stamina to go through all that. I, I, it's not fun. I know. I, I only witnessed from very closely the Marrakesh Treaty. I don't know if you heard of the Marrakesh Treaty for the. Uh, uh, exception on copyright for the visually impaired and blind people. Uh, it was negotiated in 2013 in Marrakesh, <laughs> very warm anyway, but it was the same type of uh, ongoing negotiation. That, uh, and, and you will see the whole negotiation process is utterly frustrating for any party who's not part of the national delegation. Uh, because the only people who have the power to negotiate are the national delegations. So the, the, in our case, it would be the delegation from Ottawa, from the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, and they may or may not voice the interests. Yes, I know. Um, this game, not, not a game, but a, into a conversation where they all agree, if we can come to terms and agree on something, then that's going to be the law that we abide by because it's a joint treaty. So the universal human rights is um, all the countries that signed up and then agreed to the text and then sign off on it are parties under that treaty. So it's an international treaty. It can, they can make treaties. People can make treaties at the international level. Um, but I understand what you're saying. They make it, it's sort of like, uh, how can I put it? If you voluntarily say, okay, let's six of us join a group, and let's all six of us make the rules of this group. We all agree, we all sign on, we're all parties to that pact. So that's, that's what it is, international countries sort of sign that's on. Right. But you can see and understand why I'm, I'm so uh, weary about this. It doesn't and matter we if you're weary or not. The international happens without <laughs> us. <laughs> we have international treaties. All our treaty rights are international. I know, but that's separate and apart from the conversation we're having now. We're having talking about... Wow. Because we're, we're the talking parties about are, a narrow yeah. topic yeah. In, a, in a sort of like, say you're going to this rink and you're going to play a game and you're going to talk about the rules of that game. That's within a box, within an arena, within the game plan, within the rules before you go. That's 
sort of what international is and law. What we're talking about is sovereignty and rights and, and indigenous nations not recognizing state nations. The conversation you're having is too big for the lecture today. I'm sorry. But it's very real. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's very real, but it's, it's just sort of, we're only in the arena. It's right. almost parallel. Yeah. Yeah. But we can, we can talk more. We'll yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the, so, seeing the impasse, seeing the dead end at the international level, at least for now, there might be in the long run, but you need a lot of uh, um, stamina to go through, to wait and to negotiate. So, um, there might be something that we can do nationally or even locally to try to find solutions. And this is where I'm getting at. So what are the Canadian efforts? Now, Canadian efforts at the international level are not very big. The delegation is rather small, and I, uh, they don't seem to be proactive in those dis uh, discussion on indigenous uh, knowledge. You certainly seem to know more, uh, so it's, uh, I didn't dream it. Uh, I don't understand why, on the one hand, uh, the government, uh, current government seems to um, put forward the whole idea of uh, re um, reconciliation and indigenous rights, and on the other hand, on, in such discussions on protecting indigenous culture, they don't seem to be re at all proactive or so, uh, proposing solutions or whatever. So, so what can we do at national level? So at national level, there's not much case law that's useful. The, the one case, the one decision that, that I found that does refer to uh, sacred oral tradition was um, this case from British Columbia, but it's already very old, and uh, apparently uh, courts have not uh, had the occasion to test uh, the protection or yeah uh, of uh, any type of cultural heritage uh, expression. So. Um, what about the provincial level? So there's no, there's no federal act that, uh, except for copyright law, trademark law, industrial design, um, there's not really anything that, that gives us any solution. What about the provincial level? Now, the only prov province where I found something was Quebec, where they have this cultural heritage register, where they uh, spe specifically <coughs> Uh, recognize the cultural heritage status of uh, five, which I, I uh, put together because of space on the slide, but uh, five types of uh, traditional cultural expressions. First one is the Inuit throat singing is recognized as cultural heritage. Uh, uh, Aboriginal dances, traditional dress, uh, powwow ceremonies and drum um, playing. So uh, they took this up in a register of uh, cultural heritage. The register further contains a lot of references to uh, physical um, uh, heritage, meaning buildings or parks or uh, so the, these are, are five items that are immaterial, but they're, they're together into a register that basically deals with buildings, traditional buildings, historical buildings. And in other provinces where I looked, I only came across such registers that only talk about buildings and parks, but not about the culture. And which anyway, um, doesn't say much. I mean, it's a good gesture of Quebec, perhaps, but it doesn't give any right on any community to prevent others from uh, using or from exploiting those uh, uh, types of expressions. They just uh, declared to be every, you know, the Quebec's um, 
or part of the, of the province's cultural heritage, but doesn't give any community the right to step to court or to prevent in any way. So it, it's not worth much in practice. Um, I also read uh, that sometimes private entities will intervene to stop things. Um, Oshiaga Festival, um, I'm not a festival goer, I think it's a music festival for young people. Um, and because there were incidents a few years uh, back to back of uh, young people coming with headdress uh, to the festival, uh, this made a stop to it, so from now on. But this is a private entity, so private entity, the, the festival organizers said, from now on, no one will be admitted on the, on the uh, uh, premises of the festival if they're wearing a headdress. So that put a stop to it. But it's also, again, it's not a actual right given to a community to enforce their right or the, 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 a, a claim against third parties. It's just a private entity saying, well, you know, we shall all respect uh, headdress and that's it. Um, so, and this is the question I'm asking to you uh, tonight. So what does indigenous or Mi'kmaq law and traditions say? And this is where uh, I'd like to hear from you. Um, leading into the next slide, uh, so to me, the objective would be to develop a system of protection that can coexist with the current legal framework. Because, well, <laughs> we need a solution for um, traditional cultural expressions, but uh, we won't get rid of the Copyright Act, we won't get rid of the Trademark Act or the in the, uh, Industrial Design, so that's there to stay. So how can we figure out how to protect traditional cultural expressions and also genetic resources and traditional knowledge in a way that can coexist with the normal legal, uh, legal framework. And this is where I'd like to go into dialogue either tonight or other uh, um, opportunities, other meetings that we could have. Uh, trying to figure out, you know, what type of expressions need, need ex uh, protection, what type of protection is needed, um, uh, who would benefit from the protection, uh, and what are the terms, uh, am I forgetting? Uh, um, briefly in class yesterday, that there's all this work done at the international level, some work at the national level, absolutely zero on the ground in Mi'kmaq Nation on how to protect traditional knowledge, what is it, what are cultural expressions, how would we, uh, there's, there, it's just an area that people, um, it's not transcending. Yeah, but, uh, zero percent, can't be zero percent. No, what, what I'm saying is, if, for, if somebody wanted to come here and say, where do I go to the Mi'kmaq Nation to get permission to use the eight-point stuff? They can go to pretty much, there's, there's okay. nothing. We have not coordinated, organized, or recognized um, traditional knowledge, cultural expressions, or anything in order, like we just never even have. So like, a lot of us. so like what we should be talking about is things to protect like almost like our resources such as like, um, like we, well we shouldn't be, well we shouldn't, um, like I've heard a lot of elders say that they will not buy medicines, if you buy medicines they won't work. So like should we have laws protecting like the commercialization and stuff of our like, our sweet grass, because you can go to a store across the street and buy some sweet grass, but I heard that like you shouldn't, and like I've always been told you shouldn't. Like, so, like, are we talking about, like, laws that, like, stop people from, like, commercializing our... For example, stuff? yes. Like, is that the kind of protection yes. that we're talking about? Yes, but I think it's part of it. It's a big part of it, but it may not be the only part of it, because you also have all the sacred 
expressions, which um, it's, it's not only the commercial, uh, stopping commercialization, but it's also protecting it in another way. And I think, you know, f uh, from the white perspective, uh, it's also a lack of, wor of awareness, at least on my part, on, on I think the majority's population's part, a lack of awareness of what, what is part of your uh, cultural um, heritage. What is it that we should in, uh, deal with carefully and how, how would you like us to deal with those objects? Um, we don't know. I'm very candid with that. We, we, we don't know. You, you have a question? I do have a question, but I do have something to say. Uh, I'm Gregory Mama, I'm from BC, I'm not Mi'kmaq, but I'm Indian. And the United Nations are there for our people, and it's run by the grassroots people. And I don't understand why they talk about this traditional law. I have tradition. I'm from Turtle Island. They should start looking at it as a, uh, like they say, United Nations country, well, Turtle Island's a country. Canada is not a country. And uh, I'm from Turtle Island. And that's my tradition we talk about and, and culture. Like our medicine, we don't tell people where we go pick berries or where we do this or where we go fishing. And when we do go fishing, we do ceremonies. Like there's a certain way to go pick bear, a certain way to fish, a certain way to hunt. And for for us, like for 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 natives, I'm just speaking like for everybody, because I'm a chief, I could do that. <laughs> yeah. I speak for like um, against the government. The only way to what I understand from here, our traditional law trumps Canadian law because Canada is not a country and in the United Native Nations and the UNDRIP, they should look at Turtle Island as a whole, not say Mi'kmaq or Gitsan or Ojibwe or Cree or, or down south, they say other names. And come on, look at it as a big picture as a nation. Turtle Island is a nation. I'm your sister. Um, you're my brother, or whatever. Right, that's not going to get us into the doors, and it's not going to take us into the laws. It's not going to get us far, especially where Turtle Island comes up with distinct Mi'kmaq nations and the distinct Mohawk nations. And so for us to group them together is the same as Canada grouping us as First Nations. Yeah, that, that's true. But yeah. I'm what I'm saying is that Quit separating us as, uh, as nations. Unite us. Look at, look at well, us as it, one. Yes, it was not my intention to separate you. I wanted to have examples that spoke to you, but I didn't know that you, all the way from Turtle Island, would be here tonight. You'll be so. happy to hear at the United Nations, the, um, the North American Indigenous Caucus is together. Good. All ten of us. There's nobody there. No, but the, I'd like, I don't know if you, found, you would found, find my input useful in discussions. Uh, well, yeah, she yeah. opened up a huge, what, yeah. what we came for is for us to see how big it is, see what's being done and then see what's not being done. And you gave us a glimpse of. A, it's a glimpse and I'm willing to come back and I want to, to really invest time in, in research on this topic and to help you with um, finding a solution. And 
Yes, I think ideally we would uh, find solutions that would also speak to you from Turtle Island and that would be useful for all the... But th you can't dismiss what she's saying. So what I'm, not, like, I'm not, what we're not we're I'm not. I'm not dismissing. Yes. Bands here in Nova Scotia, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what? That's a part of the conversation that we need to have around traditional knowledge. Is wh who is the Mi'kmaq Nation? Because most of the times they don't involve grassroots people. Like it's but also that splits it up again with the who's the Mi'kmaq Nation? Is it the Ainak chiefs? The Ainak chiefs do not speak on my behalf. We're grassroots Mi'kmaq. You know, so it well, kind of splits that up too. Yeah. Well, those are the decisions I really, really cannot yeah, help you with. <laughs> Conversations that yeah, have and, they're, and they're true conversations because I'm from Unamaki, but we've been down at the um, Alton Gas site protecting the river. Uh -huh. So how do we, in Mi'kmaq territory, get our ducks in a row <laughs> so that we could protect and, yes. and even even identify what? needs protected. Yes. And who yes. Do the yes. And what kind of protection? And yeah, because we don't fit easily into the categories no, uh, that she showed even us. The chiefs like Rod Google, that's my chief on my reserve in Wagama, he's the so called um, portfolio in charge of wildlife, lands and fisheries, I believe. No not fisheries. Wildlife, lands and forestry. But he has never even been down to the Alton Gas site. Right? I told him about four times, come down. That's his portfolio to protect these lands. I think uh, Afton Chief got that. Got no, that. Afton Chief's got the health. Justice. That's Andrea Paul. Mm -hmm. Afton is Justice. Oh, no. Oh, PJ. PJ. That's Pickle. Yeah. I'm sorry, Andrea Paul. Yeah, well. Well, Canada was at the UN level on the um, Convention on Biodiversity and Genetic Resources, and they were at the UN in Brazil, saying that Indigenous peoples at the UN shouldn't have a voice, that Indigenous peoples can speak through their delegations, because we have Natives on the Canadian, the official Canadian delegation to the UN. We, Indigenous people worldwide, challenged Canada and said, you may have Indigenous peoples in Canada, participating, but you don't have indigenous peoples in Mexico who have to sneak out of the country and are being killed when they go back for standing up for those rights. So I think there's all kinds of room within the Mi'kmaq community to tell our government, Canada, how we, we see things. If we're not at the UN level or if we don't figure it out here within the next the rest of our class, the next couple of weeks, if we don't figure out a um, solution, um, I'm willing to put more time into what, it. We don't even know what it needs protection or who should be doing the protection or anything like that. This is a really good conversation um, that we're having. It's huge what the work that needs to be done. Okay, because. <laughs> yeah, well, because you're my. You've already been in the arena. You're out. <laughs> Yeah. No, go ahead. We're talking with you, Madonna. Yeah. Well, because my idea is indeed is, is since it it won't come from the top down because it's it's blocked forever because uh, the uh, you know the the wipo uh, the way that it works and the lack of consensus and the too many parties. We that the solution won't come from there. Anyway, any solution that comes from there may not fit your needs because it will come all the way from Geneva and may not be useful. So my my suggestion is that it it, it would go from bottom up, that it comes from you and then it trickles through all the way up to to Pan Canada and then perhaps uh, wider. But I mean, I would be very proud if we could, you know, have a sense of 
where this community is going and what's important for this community. And this, I mean, this community <laughs> is for you to decide because I won't ever tell you <laughs> who's part or not part of your community. We don't even uh, know who the ducks are. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta start, okay, we're talking about the simulation and stuff like that and like all this genocide against our people and against our nation. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. But it's plain and simple. We've got to start looking at Canada as this corporation. It's an entity that has to file with this corporate number, this business number, every year with this business number under that um, corporation. It had never had the intention of speaking with us on a nation's nation level. It never had. Mm -hmm. They never speak to us on the, they keep saying they have, but they never will and they never, they never, their intentions were never that. I hope it will. It never will be. Because Canada is a corporation. Mm. Canada, it's a corporation. Mm. It's like a big, whole big um, oil industry. If you look at Canada Corporation, that's what it is and that's who it's for. And they're fighting right now. That's who they, that's their own interest. That's their number one interest is doing these big oil corporations down in Guatemala, down in Mexico, down out, out and they're called Canadian mining corporations. And they're killing off all these people in Guatemala. Because I know people don't want to hear this. Well, no, but it's, it's just true. Not, it's I, true. I brought my it's students happened. to talk about traditional knowledge okay. and some of those things. Uh, but I'm gonna, pull, I'm gonna jump on that because you're not out in left field, Madonna. Mm -hmm. uh, you're big, you think big. Um, but let's look at the Alton gas and we told them we're gonna do our own science and we're gonna do Mi'kmaq knowledge and Mi'kmaq science. And we jumped in the Shibi River right now, they're MCG and Indian Brook are doing Science in the river, we have a, a fishing scene there that we never had before. We're down there counting the fish. We found baby bass where Alton Science they said it wasn't there. Even though our traditional knowledge holders, the, the guys on the river that see the bass, they're there. Mm -hmm. So we are building up um, control over our traditional knowledge and our traditional activity and genetic resources. All those terms that we talked about that you thought what does that mean? It means that we're down on the ground, we're doing our own things. Um, so we are moving and organizing, but the challenge is who's doing it? The Mi'kmaq Nation, the community, um, who's gonna harness that knowledge? Who's gonna fight for the protection of it? These are things that we have to mobilize our politicians, mobilize the grassroots, and educate ourselves on what all of these things are. So you're not in left field, Madonna. We are doing some of that stuff already. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're not there. I, I, you just think big, and then I have to try to figure out, explain how it is um, happening here in Nova Scotia and Mi'kmaq territory. But it's a real challenge. <coughs> like, they could come in right now and take our knowledge. It's totally unprotected right now. They could take our genetic resources. It's unprotected right now. Um, we are unorganized right now, and a lot of us aren't even aware of these, the conversation we're having now. Um, and probably prior to this course and this lecture, you guys may not have understood either um, this big area that we're, we're getting into. Thank you. Actually, we went through my slides. This was the last slide. Do you have any other questions that I might answer? Um, and it, did I see no no okay but I uh, students have you got what, what are your thoughts now at the end of this <laughs> and I know we went all over the place I'm we went from the, kind of confused about like what what it was uh, the main <laughs> yeah well the main <laughs> message <laughs> I think the main message that I can convey to you is is that basically the legal regime right now will protect a small portion of the 
cultural expressions, uh, the paintings, the dolls, the, the, the artwork that you can identify. Uh, real stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I only talked about one of three very important uh, uh, okay. elements of the whole. I only talked about cultural expressions, but you also have traditional knowledge and genetic resources. Yes. Yes, and and to yes. <laughs> no, but then I would like to reiterate my wish to come back uh, and to talk to you, um, to try together to you know have this issue advance, so you can pick my brains uh, on how the law works, and we can pick each other's brain on how we could make the law work for you. And it may, it will need to be an entirely different solution. And we can test the solution uh, on a small scale and hope that it will, you know, expand. expand. Yes. So thank you very much. I really loved our conversation, really. I thought I, I learned as much from all of you as hopefully you learned from me, although you know a whole lot already. But uh, I hope it was clear. If you have questions, um, I know Elizabeth is uh, the main person. I forgot my business card. Um, I think everybody knows. I, I sent out the posters, so lawdean at now.ca. Ah, so I did put my, <laughs> my email address at the end. I, I did. Uh, limited by the research capabilities of the faculty. Um, there are some topics that we just don't cover, but we're always willing to look at interesting and ideal topics that might work for you. Yes, and outside of a lecture uh, framework, I'm, I'm willing to come back. If you find it useful. Can I ask a question? What is your course? Sounds yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a, a political science Mi'kmaq study special topic course, so I got to choose what I wanted to do. Oh. So we're going to look at Aboriginal traditional knowledge in different contexts. Um, so we will touch on some of the international genetic resources. We'll touch on um, a lot around traditional knowledge and environment. Um, traditional knowledge and justice, uh, child welfare, medicines, protection. So we're, wow. they're just going to get yeah. a glimpse of everything. And how many weeks do you have left? <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> it's a short, intense class, and it's their last course before they graduate. So it's going to be really fun. We're going At which institution? <laughs> Paper really University. Ah, they okay. They do a lot of satellite classes in the community. Ah. Paper University. So I get to um, teach now and then, yeah, which is fun. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you very much for your attention tonight. And thank you for coming, really, and for your participation. Thank you.